To prepare for his role as a tough cop in Bullet, Steve McQueen rode around with police officers. They wanted to see what McQueen was made of, so they took him to a morgue, but his reaction made their blood run cold. Terrence Steve McQueen wasn't some pretty boy actor who never got his hands dirty. McQueen spent most of his life racing anything that had an engine, from grueling endurance classics to wild off-road motorcycle races, and it's safe to say he got his need for speed from his father, William McQueen, who earned his keep as a stunt pilot flying in a circus. So it's little wonder that his boy Steve grew up as an adrenaline junkie, but that's about all that William McQueen gave his boy. Seeing as he abandoned Steve's mom, Julia, just six months after meeting her, leaving her pregnant and alone. Steve McQueen's mother never had much luck with men, and her son would pay the price for it time and time again. Unfortunately for little Steve, his 20-year-old mother, Julia Ann Crawford, was not ready to be a mother. From her drinking problem to her penchant for violent men, she never made her son a priority. It was a blessing, then, when she sent her boy to live with his grandparents in Missouri. It would lead to some of the best days of Steve McQueen's life, but trouble was always around the corner. McQueen remembered his days on the farm in Missouri as some of the happiest in his life, but they couldn't last forever. His mother dragged him out of his idyllic, pastoral childhood and straight into a nightmare. Julia's new husband had a violent temper, and he frequently beat young Steve McQueen. It got so bad that McQueen actually ran away from home to live on the streets at just the age of nine years old. In the blink of an eye, Steve went from having a loving family and a simple life on a farm to living on the streets of Indianapolis, afraid for his life, so it's no surprise that the boy started down a dark path. Before long, the Queen joined a street gang in Indianapolis. At the time when most kids are playing with friends and stressing about homework, Steve McQueen was prowling the city committing petty act. His mother had never been there for him, but even she started to realize that her son was headed for life behind bars. She decided to do something about it, but as always, that meant passing the buck. It had worked once, so why wouldn't it work again? Julia sent Steve back to live with his family in Missouri. However, when Steve was 12, his mother's marriage to her no-good second husband disintegrated, and she moved to sunny Los Angeles to get a fresh start, bringing her boy with her. It was here that she married for the third time, and in case you couldn't tell, she wasn't exactly into fatherly types. 12-year-old Steve and his newest stepfather hated each other from the second they met. Like his mom's last husband, this guy drank and beat both of them. Before long, McQueen was back in the same cycle of rebellion and lawbreaking. His mom threw in the towel once more and sent Steve back to Missouri. But McQueen's time on the streets had begun hardening him. The quiet, country life couldn't contain him anymore, and this trip to Missouri would be his last. At 14 years old, Steve McQueen snuck away from his great-uncle's farm and never looked back. He joined a circus for a time, but that didn't last long. And soon enough, McQueen found himself back in LA with his mother and stepfather. But this time, things were different. He was growing up, and he'd gained a dark side. Upon returning to LA, McQueen went straight back to the life on the streets. At one point, officers caught him stealing hubcaps and dragged him back to his mother's place. There, his stepfather was waiting, and as soon as the officers left, he beat McQueen as he had so many times before. The attack culminated in McQueen's stepfather throwing him down the stairs. Who knows what it was, but this beating wasn't like the others. This time, something in McQueen finally just snapped. Lying at the foot of the staircase, Steve McQueen looked up at his stepfather and uttered a chilling threat. Quote, you lay your stinking hands on me again and I swear I'll kill you. Quote, there must have been something in his eyes because this time his mother and stepfather believed him. And this marked the start of a new chapter in the life of Steve McQueen. His stepfather had his mother sign court papers that legally declared McQueen incorrigible. It let them send Steve to the California Junior Boys Republic a boarding school for troubled youths in Chino. Boys Republic was no summer camp. Regular life at the school was hard enough, but as a newcomer, the other boys tormented McQueen when he first arrived. Not only was he an outsider, but whenever he did something wrong, the teachers punished his entire class, not just him. But as time passed, things changed. McQueen started to fit in for the first time of his life, and it left a lasting impression. Although the place felt like a prison at first, it turns out the boarding school was exactly what McQueen needed. By the time he left at 16, he was a completely new person. Now over the next few years, Steve bounced around between New York, the Dominican Republic, Canada, and Texas, working as a merchant marine, at a cat house, at a carnival, as a lumberjack, before joining the Navy in 1947, all before he was 18. McQueen got off to a decent start in the armed forces, earning a promotion to private first class, but it didn't last long. 
he ended up getting demotions, getting caught in dereliction of duty, and eventually getting detained. As you can imagine, the queen didn't go quietly. He resisted and got himself 41 long days in the brig. His time there must have straightened him out a little, because McQueen shaped up and became a model marine after. The highlight of his career came during a brutal arctic exercise. While training in frozen waters, McQueen's ship suddenly hit a sandbar, throwing several men into the waves. McQueen dove into the water and pulled five other marines ashore before they succumbed to the frigid waters, saving their lives. Maybe there was more to this rebel than met the eye. Now in 1952, Steve McQueen started taking acting classes in New York City and started dating another hopeful young actress. Now his wild fling with Miss Scala didn't last long. In 1955, he moved out west to try his luck in Hollywood. It was there that he met his first love. Around a year after arriving in LA, Steve McQueen married a gorgeous actress named Neely Adams, and the couple would go on to have two children together. And just as McQueen was starting a family, his career started taking off too. McQueen fared a lot better in Hollywood than in New York. Soon enough, he even had a starring role in a feature film. Sure, the film was The Blob, a schlocky B-movie that opened alongside I Married a Monster from Outer Space, but it helped put McQueen on the map. It also helped him land a role in a TV pilot for a new western series. The show was called Wanted, Dead or Alive, and its rugged, anti-hero bounty hunter Josh Randall cemented Steve McQueen as a star. But this was just the beginning. With Wanted, Dead or Alive, Steve McQueen had finally hit a big time. Some of his most iconic roles came next, including The Magnificent Seven and The Great Escape. It had taken about a decade, but Steve McQueen officially arrived, and Hollywood's newest leading man quickly set himself apart from his peers. Anyone who worked with him could tell you, Steve McQueen was willing to do things that no other actor would, or could for that matter. Unsurprisingly, Steve McQueen often ended up in movies where he had to ride motorcycles or drive fast cars. For most actors, a stunt double would do the majority of the actual driving, but McQueen wasn't most actors. Directors quickly realized that McQueen could drive better than most of their stuntmen, and McQueen ended up filming many of his action scenes himself. In fact, in The Great Escape, you can actually see McQueen dressed as a German soldier on a motorcycle, chasing himself. But his biggest movie almost destroyed him. In 1968, McQueen landed the most iconic role of his career, Bullet, a movie about a tough San Francisco cop who drives a Mustang and gets into a thrilling car chase through the winding streets. But what could go wrong? Well, actually, it turns out a lot could go wrong. In fact, despite the final result, Bullet very nearly ruined McQueen's career. Between the perfectionism of director Peter Yates and McQueen himself, Bullet went massively over budget, much to the horror of Warner Brothers studio execs. Before filming, McQueen had a massive contract with the studio that would have seen him make seven more movies. But after the bullet debacle, they'd had enough. They cancelled the contract before the movie had even came out. Although this turned out to be one of the stupidest moves in history. Because yes, although Bullet went over budget, it was also a smash hit with the critics and audiences. It raked in 10 times its inflated budget. So Warner Bros did what any self-respecting Hollywood studio would do. They came running back to McQueen with their tails between their legs begging him to sign another contract, but by then, they had already burned that bridge. Now, while McQueen's career was thriving, his marriage was on the rocks. Steve and his wife Neely had started growing apart, and her 1971 abortion pushed their relationship to its breaking point. They'd been together for over 15 years, but that didn't stop McQueen from falling into the arms of another woman. And if that's not bad enough, McQueen's affair was with one of his co-stars, Steve McQueen and Ally McGraw had instant chemistry on the set of The Getaway. The only problem was that both of them were married, but McGraw's marriage was apparently just as frayed as McQueen's, and the pair began a secret affair. Unfortunately for them, few affairs in Hollywood stay secret for long. The affair with McGraw was the last straw for McQueen's wife. It also just so happened to be the last straw in McGraw's marriage as well. Neither of them wanted to waste any time, and within just a year, they had divorced their spouses and married each other. But just like his last marriage, this one would burn out before long. The difference was, this one would burn a lot brighter and a lot faster. Now many of Steve's friends called Ally McGraw the love of his life, but their relationship was never simple. As Ally put it herself, quote, There were many times that were just wonderful, and there were many times that were just ghastly, quote. McQueen was a mercurial man, and living with him wasn't exactly easy. Then, as if their marriage wasn't stressed enough, 
a tragedy made things so much worse. Allie McGraw suffered a miscarriage during her brief, fiery marriage to Steve McQueen. Between the horrible loss and their tumultuous relationship, this marriage was doomed. Despite their love for each other, McQueen and McGraw just couldn't make it work, divorcing in 1978. But McQueen hadn't been alone in years, so it was only a matter of time before he found someone new. So how does a megastar actually meet girls? Apparently he has his agent set up a date. Not long after the split from Ali McGraw, Steve laid his eyes on an utterly entrancing woman. Not on the street or on set. He saw her in an advertisement. But this is Steve McQueen we're talking about, so that wasn't about to stop him. He had his agent track down the model from the ad and set up a date. Her name was Barbary Minty, and she became McQueen's third and final wife. For most of his life, McQueen was a serial monogamist, but he still had his fair share of flings. He had an affair with an actress and model Lauren Hutton in the early 1960s while still married to his wife. He also had an affair with Barbara Lay, his co-star in Junior Bonner, shortly before he met Ali McGraw. But those paled in comparison to his wildest affair. Mammy Van Doren was one of Hollywood's great, incorrigible starlets and she claimed to have a sordid affair with McQueen in the 1960s. The pair would party long into the night, taking hallucinogenins together, all while McQueen was still married with kids. Though many people close to McQueen would vouch for him as an all-around great guy, it seemed as though women were always his greatest vice, and they brought out his dark side. Now in the mid-1970s, while arguably the biggest star on the planet, Steve McQueen stepped away from it all. He disappeared from the public eye, stopped appearing in movies, and spent his days driving around the country in a motorhome, racing motorcycles wherever he stopped. While the appeal of acting eventually waned for him, racing always had his heart. But maybe this wasn't his only reason for stepping away. It turns out McQueen had some skeletons in the closet. Between his up and down career and his rocky love life, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Steve McQueen suffered from addiction issues throughout his life. By the 1970s, he was nearly at rock bottom. He smoked like a chimney and drank heavily, and he pretty much covered all his bases when it came to partying. Now around the time that his marriage to Ali McGraw disintegrated, Steve McQueen developed a persistent cough. Not too surprising given how much he smoked, but even when he quit, the cough remained. He tried antibiotic treatments, but still, he couldn't stop coughing. He finally went for a biopsy, and the results were devastating. Steve McQueen had cancer, but that doesn't mean Steve McQueen was going down without a fight. When American doctors told Steve McQueen there was nothing they could do, he started to look elsewhere, and this led him to a truly twisted character. There was nothing anyone could do to save Steve McQueen, but he wasn't about to admit that. He traveled to Mexico, seeking advice from a quack named William Donald Kelly. Kelly falsely claimed that he had a method that could cure cancer, and McQueen was desperate, so he listened. He underwent treatment with Kelly, and it involved operations that ranged from bizarre to horrifying. And as if these humiliating, uncomfortable, and ineffective treatments weren't bad enough, Kelly had the audacity to charge the desperate McQueen $40,000 a month. Now did I mention that Dr. William Donald Kelly had had his medical license revoked? years before this? And did I mention that he had only been an orthodontist? But McQueen had absolutely no other options, so he listened anyway. In October 1980, McQueen flew down to Mexico one last time. He had a massive five pound tumor on his liver, but his American doctors told him they couldn't operate on it. It was too large and he was too weak. There was no way his heart could stand the operation. Still, McQueen had come this far, so he wasn't about to stop now. McQueen signed himself into a small Mexican medical clinic, but Steve McQueen passed from heart failure at 3.45 a.m. on November 7, 1980, at the clinic in Mexico, not long after his surgery. He was only 50 years old. Now, a lot of movies hire real professionals to teach actors about the characters they're playing, and Bullet was no different. Producers brought in some grizzled old police officers to show McQueen the ropes. They figured that they would give McQueen a good scare by taking him to an actual morgue. After all, there is a morgue scene in the movie, and I imagine they were looking forward to spooking this Hollywood pretty boy, but McQueen's ice-cold reaction left them stunned. On the day of the morgue visit, McQueen casually strolled into the morgue, apple in hand, just like it was another day at the office. And from that moment on, he had earned those officers' respect. 
Now with Steve McQueen's violent past, his Hollywood affairs, and his addiction issues, let us know what was most interesting to you about his life. And if you're curious about more interesting Hollywood stories, make sure to subscribe to the Factinit YouTube channel.